Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are going to have a bit of benchmark fun. I've managed to get my hands on a processor that until recently I didn't even realize I hadn't benchmarked before and that is the Core i7-980X processor. In fact I haven't actually benchmarked any of the 32 nanometer Golf Town processors before. Again, not sure why that is. I've benchmarked plenty of the Bloomfield 45 nanometer parts. I was a big fan of the Core i7-920, and I still have a few of those floating around actually, but I never checked out any of the Golf Town processors, so why not do that now? Before we get to the benchmarks, because I know plenty of you will be keen to check those out, as always, we'll just go for a quick trip down memory lane, though it won't be my memory because I didn't test this processor previously. So just to a quick history lesson then I suppose. Uh, the Bloomfield and Golf Town processors share the same LGA 1366 socket, but the newer 32 nanometer parts are a little bit special in the sense that they pack six cores. In fact, the Core i7-980X was Intel's first ever six core desktop CPU. And if you imagine it being expensive, well, you'd be right. That sucker came in at $1,000 US back in early 2010. The six cores operate at a base frequency of 3.3 GHz and boost to 3.6 GHz depending on the workload. Although designed to work with DDR3 1066 memory, it was possible to run with higher memory speeds and given that the LGA 1366 socket was part of the Intel high-end desktop platform at the time, triple channel memory support was offered in favor of the more standard dual channel memory operation. So, in short, the Core i7-980X was a beast, the best desktop CPU money could buy, the only issue being, as mentioned earlier, you needed a lot of money. But what I want to know is, how well does it stack up eight years later? To find out, I'm going to compare it to a whole heap of modern processors, including the dinky little $100 US Ryzen 3 2200G. Now, I don't expect the 2200G to be able to beat the 6-core 12-thread Core i7 processor running at no less than 3.3 gigahertz. After all, the 2200G is a 4-core 4-thread CPU that runs at a base frequency of just 3.5 gigahertz, has a little 4 megabyte level 3 cache, and packs a maximum TDP of just 65 watts. Oh yeah, and did I mention the 980X is a 130 watt CPU? Still, I'm interested to see how 2010's flagship desktop CPU compares to 2018's most affordable AMD Ryzen CPU. Also thrown into the mix are the first and second generation Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 CPUs, along with a few KB Lake and Coffee Lake CPUs as well. The Core i7-980X has been benchmarked in its stock out-of-the-box trim, as well as an overclock configuration at 4.4GHz. For the memory, I have six 2GB sticks of DDR3-1600 memory, and that's the best stuff I have available for this test. So let's see how Intel's first ever 6-core desktop CPU stacks up in 2018. First up, we have the Sci Software Memory Bandwidth Benchmark, and here we can clearly see the advantage of high-speed DDR4 memory. The Ryzen 3 2200G has almost 50% more memory bandwidth at its disposal when compared to the triple-channel DDR3-1600 configuration of the Core i7-980X. With just 23 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, the 980X will be severely limited in memory-intensive workloads. Moving on to Cinebench R15, which isn't particularly memory sensitive, here we see the 6-core 12-thread 980X does do reasonably well. That said, the single-core performance is rather weak, and shockingly, even at 4.4 GHz is well down on what the 2200G offers. In fact, the single-thread performance of the 980X was 8% slower than that of the 2200G, and 17% slower once the APU is overclocked. Still, the 2200G's four threads can't compete with the old 12-threaded CPU, at least in the multi-threaded workload, and is up to 37% slower once both CPUs are overclocked. That said, when compared to a modern 6-core 12-thread Ryzen processor such as the 2600X, the 980X is 30% slower, actually 43% when comparing the stock numbers. Next up, we have the V-Ray benchmark, and here we see the 980X looks much slower than what you might expect, particularly given what we just saw when testing with Cinebench. The result, however, is accurate, and the reason why the 980X is so slow here is down to its complete lack of AVX instructions. AVX was introduced a year later with the Sandy Bridge architecture, so the 980X is going to lag behind severely in workloads that take advantage of AVX instructions. And here with V-Ray, we do have a perfect example of this as the 980X is only able to match the 2200G, a CPU with only a third of the threads offered by the Core i7 processor. 
Still, once overclocked, the 980X is able to edge out the 2200G, but we're talking about a 7% reduction in render time for what will likely be double the power draw, and we will look at power consumption towards the end of the video. For now though, let's move on to video editing performance as we take a look with PC Mark 10. Here the Ryzen 3 APU is able to beat the Core i7-980X, both stock and overclocked. Stock the AMD CPU is 7% faster, and though that margin is reduced once both CPUs are overclocked, the plucky little quad core was still 3% faster. The PC Mark 10 gaming physics test does take advantage of core heavy processors and it doesn't use an instruction set that's absent in the older Core i7 model. As a result, the 980X is able to match the Core i5-8400 out of the box and once overclocked, actually beats the 8400, 8600K and even the 7700K. That said, it's still slower than the Ryzen 5 1600 and much slower than the newer Ryzen 5 2600 models. Next up, we have the 7-zip file extraction test, and here the Core i7-980X does do very well, especially when compared to more modern 6-core 12-thread processors like the Ryzen 5 1600, as it was just 11% slower. That said, once overclocked, it was able to match the stock Ryzen 5 2600, so not a bad result, but of course the Ryzen CPUs can also be overclocked. Moving on, we have the Corona performance, and again, very respectable results here. The four-threaded Ryzen 3 2200G, for example, is completely overwhelmed by the older six-core Core i7 processor. That said, Blender is another application that employs AVX instructions, and like what we saw with V-Ray, the Core i7-980X really struggles due to its lack of AVX support. As a result, it's reduced to quad-core light performance as it just matched the Ryzen 3 2200G. Overclocking did help, but even so, it was well down on where you might expect a 12-thread CPU running at well over 4 GHz to be. Handbrake also runs AVX code, and again, we find the 980X is only able to deliver quad-core light performance, making it significantly slower than a modern 6-core 12-thread CPU. Now for some gaming benchmarks, and we see despite having three times the threads and a notable clock speed advantage, the 980X isn't exactly worlds faster than the Ryzen 3 2200G. Sure, it was 25% faster when overclocked, and that is certainly a noteworthy margin, but honestly, I expected a much more serious advantage in a core-heavy game. That said, we do see the 980X doing very well in Battlefield 1, outpacing the 2200G by a convincing 36% margin, and that is once both CPUs are overclocked. In fact, once overclocked, the 980X isn't that much slower than the Ryzen 5 1600, albeit stock Ryzen 5 1600, but still not a bad result. However, most games aren't as core heavy as Battlefield 1 and Ashes of the Singularity, and we certainly see a good example of that here when testing with Far Cry 5. Here the 2200G was actually 8% faster than the 980X when comparing both CPUs stock performance. Overclocking does put the 980X back ahead, but it was still slower than the stock Ryzen 5 1600 for example. Last up, we have Vermintide 2, and this title does scale quite well on core-heavy CPUs, and as a result, the 980X was 25% faster than the 2200G when comparing overclocked results. That said, it was still 18% slower than a very GPU-limited Ryzen 5 2600. Okay, time for some total system power consumption figures, and please note these numbers also include a GTX 1080 Ti. Here we see the Ryzen 3 2200G system drawing up to 315 watts from the wall, while the stock 980X increased consumption by 55%, hitting 489 watts. And again, remember, that's entire system consumption, which makes the over 50% increase even more shocking. Then, once overclocked, the 980X system was sucking down 64% more power than the overclocked 2200G. Now, these are the truly scary numbers. Full CPU load with very light GPU usage. Now, the stock 980X system is drawing 93% more power than the 2200G and 133% more once overclocked. Getting back to the stock numbers, the 980X also consumed 30% more than the 2600X, so unsurprisingly, the 8-year-old CPU isn't very efficient by today's standards. Well, there you have it, the Core i7-980X compared to a number of modern CPUs in 2018. Has to be said, if it wasn't for the lack of AVX support, the 980X would have looked much more impressive in our application benchmarks. Still, when it came to gaming, the results weren't half bad, especially when we look at those 4.4 GHz results. Of course, power consumption was... A bit atrocious, it has to be said, though we are looking at a 6-core 12-threaded CPU from 2010 using the 32 nanometer process. 
Ignoring the AVX workloads, the 980X out of the box, so that's before we overclock it, it was 37% faster than the Ryzen 3 2200G in Cinebench R15's multi-threaded test. However, it does pack 50% more cores, and then of course it does have hyper-threading, which means it has three times as many threads. So a 37% increase in multi-threaded score isn't particularly impressive, and that's because we see the single thread performance was down by 26%. So that being the case, the Core i7-980X doesn't stack up nearly as well to a modern 6-core 12-thread processor. And even the first generation Ryzen 5 1600 had its way with Intel's first ever 6-core desktop CPU. The R5 1600 was 19% faster in Cinebench R15's multi-threaded test and 25% faster in games such as Ashes of the Singularity. Again, this test was really just a bit of fun and served no real purpose. It's certainly not intended to be buying advice. The 980X made little sense in 2010 and it certainly makes no sense in 2018, especially given the current asking price which seems to be about $200 US. That said, there is a certain breed of PC users that will be quick to point out that you can get a Xeon equivalent for much less. and. Well, that is true. The Xeon X5675, for example, can be regularly had for around $80 US, less than half that of the 980X. These are essentially the same 6-core 12-thread CPUs. They even work on the same X58 motherboards and can be overclocked to similar frequencies. And some of the better chips will even do 4.5 gigahertz. The problem I have with these CPUs isn't necessarily the CPUs themselves. As we've seen, despite some pretty horrendous power figures, the overall performance isn't bad, assuming you're not running software that takes advantage of AVX, in which case it is bad. Besides that though, the big problem are the motherboards. Just getting one can be hard enough, but getting one for a reasonable price is near on impossible. Assuming you don't want to spend every waking hour seeking out a bargain, though even then there are really few to be had, you're looking at having to pony up around $100 to $150 US for an X58 motherboard. And the better examples, the boards you're actually going to want to use, are much closer to the $150 US mark. Realistically, you're looking at around $230 US for a Xeon X5675 and X58 motherboard combo. And then you'll also need some DDR3 memory. But that stuff's much cheaper than DDR4. So that's probably the biggest win for this combo. 12 gigabytes looks to be about $70 US, about the same price as eight gigabytes of DDR4. So if we were to include 12 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, that would push the Xeon build out to about $300 US. Alternatively, you could buy a Ryzen 5 2600 for $170 US, a B350 board for about $60 US, and then eight gigabytes of DDR4 memory for around $70 US, and that gives us a grand total of $300 US. That being the case, I just find the Ryzen 5 2600 to make so much more sense. Stock, you can just pull the thing out of the box, stick it on the board, start the system up, and it will just smoke an overclocked X5675. So personally, I just no longer get the love affair some people seem to have with these old Xeon CPUs. Pre-Ryzen, they were great, but unless you can get a CPU, motherboard, and memory combo for well under $200 US, it's simply not worth it at this point. There's also a number of security vulnerabilities on these platforms that likely aren't going to get patched, so you'll just have to live with those. And if they do get patched, there will be some kind of performance decline there, so all that is worth keeping in mind. Having said all that, if you would like me to compare the Xeon X5675 to, say, the Ryzen 5 2600 and a heap of games, then I can certainly make that happen. Let me know in the comment section below if you want to see that happen. I think I said that at the start. Let's just move on. Uh, actually, let's just end the video. I think we're done. I think I've said everything that needs to be said, so if you like the video, you know what to do. Uh, subscribe for more videos just like this one and if you want to support the channel more directly check out our patreon account you can gain access to our discord chat and talk about old xeon processors or new ryzen processors or whatever you like there we will answer any questions and we also do a monthly live stream that's a blast we did that about a week ago so you just missed that but you could go back and watch it i suppose and then you can jump in the next live stream next month and and yeah i feel like i'm this outro is going for longer than it needs to, so uh, I think this is the point where I say thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I will see you again next time.